Hi and welcome to Episode. This is episode 391 with guest Michael Egorov. So I'm Brian Crane and I'm here with my co-host CK. Now before we're going to talk about Mike with Michael about Curve Finance, which is one of the uh, automated market maker protocols that's gotten the most traction. Uh, we want to just spend a minute to mention a few sponsors. So there's Paraswap and Paraswap is a great way to trade tokens on chain. Paraswap just came out with a big update and it's even faster and more liquid. So it's cheaper than Uniswap and comes with a new gas token that can cut your gas fees by up to 50%. So Paraswap is also now a multi-chain and has expanded to Polygon and Binance Smart Chain. So start trading at paraswap.io slash epicenter. And second, Solana. So Solana is a next generation blockchain with lightning fast blocks and fees less than a cent per transaction. Scalability is perhaps the single biggest challenge, uh, preventing crypto from becoming the backbone of the world's financial system today. And Solana may well be the best solution uh, we have at this point. So go to solana.com slash epicenter and uh, learn more about how to get involved in the Solana ecosystem. And the final one, Exodus. So Exodus is an easy to use wallet, which supports hundreds of assets and has native apps for all platforms, including iOS and Androids. It's a fully non-custodial wallet. They're firm believers in that not your keys, not your coins mantra. So go to exodus.com and give it a try. Now with that, let's go into our episode. So Michael, it's such a pleasure to have you. Thanks for coming on. Maybe just share a little bit background about yourself, like what's what's been your journey and especially kind of like your journey to uh, becoming involved in the crypto space. So yeah, basically my crypto journey started in late 2013 uh, with buying a little bit of Bitcoin. Um, at the time I was doing postdoc in physics after receiving PhD in physics. And shortly after, I actually went to the United States to work in tech industry at LinkedIn at, at the time. And I've learned a lot, of, a lot about crypto um, at that time as well. And, um, and actually started a company which was not doing crypto called uh, ZeroDB, which is now called NewCypher. And it's operating in crypto. So anyway, that's kind of how it started. And but, but what I am doing right now is quite different. And that is because I actually become quite a heavy DeFi user starting from late uh, 2018, I guess, uh, with MakerDAO. And um, I always had this problem of um, swapping between stable coins all the time because I was doing that on Coinbase and that was not quite effective. And at the same time, I was uh, doing some uh, some trading bots, and this kind of created the idea how to swap between stable coins effectively. And that's uh, that what started uh, started Curve Finance. And in the beginning of 2020, I've uh, um, finished implementation of my algorithm in in Viper and you know, the basic UI, and st- uh, started. Curve.fi. And basically, uh, what we have today is a continuation of that. Maybe let's start by diving into Curve directly here. So do you mind, for people who are not familiar with Curve, can you explain how Curve works, first of all, from the perspective of somebody who wants to trade? And, you know, let's say with your example of like, you know, swapping different, uh, swapping different, uh, maybe stable coins. Right, right. Yeah. So currently, the primary purpose of uh, of Curve is exchanging between two coins of the same denomination, most notably US dollar stable coins, like USDC and DAI, for example. But also there are BTC denominated coins. So you can swap between BTC and BTC, and even ETH denominated coins. For example, uh, for example, if uh, well, real Ethereum and you know staked Ethereum, staked with Lido, uh, for example, that's also a popular use case. So, and basically, you could you could swap for a reason of let's say let's say if it's 
if you want to interact with MakerDAO, you probably won't die. And if you have USDC, it's probably a coin which is easy to uh, redeem to your bank account. And that could be one reason to swap. Or, for example, if you want uh, to go from your Ethereum to staked Ethereum, you could also do it that way. Or maybe the other way around. That's kind of from the, from the trader perspective. And on the other hand, there are users who deposit on uh, in, into curve pools. And they earn trading fees and also CRV tokens and maybe some subsidies by the protocols who sponsor the pools. And that's kind of the yield you get as a depositor in the pools. That's how the liquidity gets there in the first place. Yeah, I sh should actually also add uh, this disclaimer here, which I meant to, which is that yeah, I do use that. Uh, so I've we've been with my company kind of very involved in Lido. So I'm, I'm doing exactly that at the moment, right? Where I put a, a lot of my ether into Lido and then got the stake ether out and then put that into the curve pool between ether and staked ether. So, and have having that process also earn some CRV. So I have also some of those tokens at this point. Now with, I guess one of the essential things around curve, right? Is that, you know, if you compare it, so, you know, you have basically this function you know, where you, you're trading, not with a counterparty, uh, like, so there's not like, or the, the counterparty is kind of like a smart contract. And then there is a function that determines the price. Can you talk a bit about how that works with Curve and what's special in this regard for Curve? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. So basically, what what is common for many for many of the automatic market makers is that you have some liquidity in all the coins involved, and let's say you when you swap from coin A to coin B as you the user buys a little bit of coin B from the pool and the pool gets also more of coin A, the price shifts a little bit so that coin B, which gets bought, becomes a little bit more expensive. And then uh, the so-called bonding curves, they describe how this pricing changes. Different protocols have different bonding curves. For, for example, Uniswap 2 has constant product bonding curve, which is where the pool basically rebalances the whole holdings. What we did, we kind of concentrated liquidity around the price uh, 1.0. That's where the liquidity is most needed. But then it's um, kind of smoothly going down to as you get away from, uh, from the price uh, 1.0. So uh, basically, when you're close to 1.0, you get the highest depth of uh, liquidity. But let's say if the price changes a little bit, let's say it becomes 1.01, .01, you have uh, the depth being um, a little bit less. And there are pool parameters which define how tightly are you concentrated around this uh, 1.0 price. Different assets may need kind of different uh, concentration of this. It depends on the asset volatility. For example, stable coins like USDC and USDT are very, very stable. So you can be very, very dense around one price 1.0. And something like staked ETH is expected to be much more volatile. So uh, you, we need to be to have liquidity a little bit more spread out, but still much, much tighter than kind of a universal uh, relationship, uh, which. Uniswap 2 or Sushi Swap or Balancer has. How did you come up with this design in the early days, uh, the stable swap paper? It seems like a very elegant solution to specifically like low volatility pairs. What was like the process from like ideation? How did you realize this was a problem in the beginning? Because you were working on new, new Cypher at the time. And how, how did you go towards the design you have uh, now? Yeah, as I said, the problem itself is it was kind of easy for me to figure because I was a heavy DeFi user and I always had this problem of swapping between DAI and USDC pretty much. So that's uh, that was one thing. 
but the question how how to come up with a with this mathematical relationship it was interesting as well because firstly it was it started from a graph like bonding curves can be represented by graphs so for the simple constant product uh, idea which was already out you uh, the graph is basically hyperbolic and i first thought like we, that the part which is close to price 1.0 should be flat and but not necessarily like completely flat because if it's completely flat then you kind of you have kind of infinite uh, depth so um, and uh, basically I first like, started graphing it on paper and then I started thinking what would be the formula which corresponds to this graph and also this formula should be not very complex because if it's too complex then I wouldn't be able to solve it in a smart contract and not eat all the gas and uh, yeah so that's basically how I came up with with the design and the, the formula for this so when you're looking for a flight, you go to a flight aggregator to see all the different places where you can buy the flight, to get all the options and make sure you get the best price for your travel plans. And when you're making a DeFi swap, just do the same and use Paraswap. It beats the market prices across all the major DEXs because it aggregates them and thanks to their network of professional market makers, you get zero slippage on your trades. So they just pushed a huge update that's even faster, more liquid, thanks to a brand new algorithm. Paraswap is now multi-chain and has expanded to Polygon and Binance Smart Chain. So go and check it out. Give Paraswap a try at paraswap.io slash epicenter. And from what I kind of understand of Uniswap v3 is that it allows you to recreate any graph in price space, including, you know, the stable swap graph. Yeah, in principle, correct. Yes, uh, it does allow you to create uh, such graphs piece by piece, uh, something like a spline, where you basically users can create their pieces of the spline and deposit liquidity into into those pieces. And in principle, that's uh, that's actually good. I actually had this same idea uh, in early 2020 as well uh, for volatile pairs until I had some other idea which I'm uh, currently implementing, which I think is fully automated, so it's better. Uh, but even like if we talk about stable coins, uh, one key difference is that uh, we are able to, uh, to quickly change these parameters without users redepositing anything. For example, imagine that you, you have one graph. Well, just an example from, from maybe a week ago. We had liquidity for staked ETH uh, with Lido being, let's say, spread uh, approximately within like plus minus 10% from the price 1.0. But it turns out that ST ETH uh, is actually very, very stable. So we are able to provide liquidity much better for it by concentrating it tighter. And we did, didn't have to ask users to kind of do, to redeposit liquidity into whatever ranges. Um, we just made a DAO proposal to increase this, this amplification coefficient, how we call it, parameter, uh, by a factor of five. And over one week, this liquidity becomes tighter by a factor of five, basically, as we speak. It's, it does so very gradually in, uh, if I remember correctly, 5,000 steps. That's absolutely kind of transparent to the user. So basically, as we, as we speak in this uh, episode, the liquidity in that pool becomes tighter and tighter without transactions becoming more expensive, without anyone redepositing anything anywhere. So in principle, these um, analytical solutions, they allow to do that quite cheaply so they are superior in that regard to uh, to uniswap v3 approach although i definitely can can see that the uniswap v3 approach is uh, allows for like very high levels of customizability maybe at the expense of being a bit less convenient for liquidity providers so they should be quite professional sounds like 
yeah, that explanation was really good. So I, I think it's it's not easy to wrap your head around, you know, this entire like automated market makers and exactly how it works, right? But I think one one way that I think it's it's interesting to sort of conceptualize like why are automated market makers interesting is if you if you take an exchange, a traditional order book exchange like Binance, then there are of course mar- market makers there. And, you know, these are like professional firms, right, that are, that are putting maybe bid orders in and ask orders in and they're watching other exchanges and they're updating them and they're providing liquidity that way and they're also earning money that way. But, you know, I can't do that because I don't have the knowledge, the infrastructure, you know. And so what you're, what, but then with Curve, you're basically saying, okay, we have a program that does it. And anyone can give money to the program. And now you can be a market maker. Anyone can be a market maker. And then actually with the Uniswap thing, you're almost going into, with the V3 thing, right? It almost goes into a little bit of this hybrid thing where, well, anyone can provide money to the market maker, but there's a lot of parameters to choose and maybe to change and update so that like, you know, you can do it better versus Curve is still sort of in the, yeah. Yeah. So if you explain Uniswap 3 in these terms, it's almost like a traditional like a traditional exchange, but instead of having um, discrete orders, you have a continuous order book. So instead of orders which probably date back to uh, to like ancient times where you you had to write orders in in an actual paper order book you you can actually have them continuous and uh, that's how it should have been when computers appeared but that wasn't the case until uniswap 3 i guess but really i think this is an improvement over traditional order books but still like the level of skill required to provide liquidity in general for volatile pairs over there Mm -hmm. is i think the same so you kind of in traditional order books, you just had to put, I don't know, a letter of orders, right, to sometimes. And on Uniswap V3, you just have to spread liquidity from price A to price B for that. That's certainly an improvement. But to, like, to, to figure where to put your liquidity, like that, there is a considerable skill required. And like, just to give you an example, imagine that I'm providing liquidity for Ethereum, right? Let's say Ethereum price is at, I don't know, 3,000. So, and I've provided liquidity from, I don't know, 3,000 to 3,100. And it worked well while Ethereum was there, but then when price went up, I'm left with, with dollars. So, okay, I take dollars and provide uh, liquidity in a new price but if i do that i'm kind of losing on uh, on ethereum uh, going up and the same with with it going down let's say imagine i provided liquidity at uh, 4000 and then it dropped to 3000 i'm left with ethers which were at around 4000 maybe a little bit less and uh, uh, then i was uh, back holding those while the price drops to 3000 so <laughs> I'm losing again so that's kind of uh, what you, what happens if you do everything naively so it's a powerful tool but naive uh, liquidity provision probably doesn't let you make uh, money over there so that's kind of uh, that's a problem with with that but that's also a problem with uh, centralized exchanges and uh, but but yeah, market making firms are probably making money, so they are probably skillful skillful enough to uh, to do that. And I think they are the users that they would be the best liquidity providers for Uniswap three. Let's get to our sponsor Solana. Now this is a special ad for me to read because I've been a deep supporter of this project since meeting the Solana team back in two thousand eighteen. I invest personally in the project and my company, Course One, is super deeply involved in the Solana ecosystem, including running the biggest validator. So what's so cool about Solana? Well, we all know that scalability is the single most important issue facing the blockchain industry today. And the Solana blockchain is an amazing solution for it. The network supports thousands of transactions per second, 
with 400 millisecond block times and over 500 validators. The special thing about Solana is also that it's not a sharded blockchain. It's a single blockchain hyper-optimized for performance. So that makes it really easy to maintain composability between all of the apps on Solana so that they work together seamlessly now and forever. The Solana ecosystem is growing at a rapid pace and it's a great place to build your project or just get involved with the community. So go to solana.com slash epicenter to learn more. I would love to expand a little bit on this more generally. I listened to another podcast with you where you said that you think, you know, automated market makers are, you know, this kind of like fundamental improvement, fundamentally superior to traditional order book exchanges. You kind of like said a similar thing here. Can you explain why you think that's the case? Basically, they are pretty transparent in what's happening. You pretty much know that they they will do the right thing, what they're programmed to do. But also from my observations, automated market makers can be can be probably not worse than what traditional market makers can do. While being not custodial, so uh, they can amass much more liquidity. And maybe maybe traditional market makers would argue that <laughs> that their markets are more effective than than Uniswap 2 or Balancer, which is true, but for cryptos. But also, I think it's possible to do much, much better for cryptos. At least, at least we will try to prove it. In that vein, what do you see as the long-term vision for Curve? Where is Curve in five years, 10 years, and what use cases is it, uh, is it allowing? I think we are currently we currently started with stable pairs, but I think if we go a little bit beyond that, we probably would allow fully automatic creation of very effective crypto markets or foreign exchange markets, and like who knows which uh, like how much we can replace traditional uh, order book approaches. But I think that's uh, that quite can happen to a certain degree. Got it. So do you see it like kind of going into Uniswap's territory a little bit of uh, allowing arbitrary uh, exchange between any pair of tokens or? Yeah, I think that's uh, that's, uh, of course, a sensible thought. But because you are talking about five and ten years, we may talk about, um, I don't know, about stock markets, about uh, foreign exchanges, about like all sorts of exchanges which are known traditionally. Because I think the, the story here is bigger than, uh, you know, one DeFi project versus the other. It's, it's about whole DeFi space capturing the traditional finance market. This is probably a good time to mention that I'm, you know, disclaimer, also a Curve user and uh, and token holder as well and have been participating in, and following along uh, with this journey. Cool. So this is one of the things that I've also, like, wondered about because with automated market makers, you know, like Curve and Uniswap, like, getting these, like, enormous volumes and when you've seen how they have taken, you know, a really substantial market share at this point from, you know, centralized crypto exchanges. And, you know, centralized crypto exchanges are still like, you know, good products, right? Like they work well, like user-friendly, you can make an account easily, deposit money easily, like so much better than uh, traditional financial institutions in many regards. But like still you've seen on-chain, you know, these automated market makers take, a substantial market share from that so i have also kind of wondered with like is is that at this point this kind of like breakthrough success of uh of crypto and of blockchain that it has you know better market mechanisms and you know whether that is going to be the thing that will really sort of drive you know the inroads towards 
taking more market share, you know, from traditional financial systems. Like, do you think that's the case, or do you think there are going to be other drivers that will be critical for this kind of transition? One thing I would say that it's not necessarily. I mean, indeed, like the blockchain activity kind of takes uh, quite a bit of centralized exchange market share, but also we've seen Binance kind of uh, successfully solving this problem with Binance Smart Chain, which is, um, which is yes, it is centralized, but uh, it is centralized with the central authority being Binance and not the services which are built over there. So it's basically, if, if you do it on a centralized exchange, uh, you couldn't give some trading firm money to trade non-custodially. And, but on something like on, a, on an exchange chain, you actually can do that. You can do like money to trade to some, uh, uh, to some decentralized service. And that makes a big difference, even if the chain is controlled by the exchange. And yep, still Ethereum is better in like my view. But uh, as we can see, it's still quite successfully uh, the exchange chain can, can get some, some bit of market share. So that's kind of the evolution of that model. Awesome. Wanted to shift gears a little bit to maybe a little bit of a different direction. But seeing uh, Uniswap and SushiSwap, how do you think about your moat? What do you think about fork threat, uh, forks in general, or you know projects that are very similar like Saddle, when you think about Curve's long-term success? Yeah, there are, there are many ways to establish this mode. One is if you, if you look at how, how quickly forks were created, it took some time to understand the, the mechanism, how the market making works in, on Curve. It's, it was a little bit harder to understand that, than constant product. And this gives a little bit of time to like before forks start appearing. I think uh, probably Uniswap 3, because it's quite a bit less understood by people who, who, may, be f who may fork. So maybe it has some of this mode as well at the moment. Another way is probably a good uh, token economics. I think, uh, I think our token economics uh, is probably good for, for kind of uh, keeping the competition away as much as possible. And uh, another thing is it, it's probably it's probably good to allow the forks, but in such a way that they benefit the protocol. We tried to do that with uh, with a few forks. We'll see how it goes. But yeah, that's that's another way. So yeah, but it's still kind of experimentation phase. So we are looking at at different uh, ways to either preserve the dominance of the protocol or to get uh, to get it done so that if forks appear that the same people pretty much own part of the forks and stuff like that and we will see what works out Let's get to our sponsor, Exodus. Exodus is a fantastic cryptocurrency wallet that strikes the right balance between ease of use, security, and great features. You can get Exodus on the iPhone, desktop app, web app, Android, whatever platform you use. It's a non-custodial wallet, and that is so critical. Because what's the point of crypto if you don't control your own assets? With Exodus, you always do. They're old school and they've been around since 2015. Over 1.2 million users rely on Exodus, so you know that they've stood the test of time. They have support for over 100 different crypto assets. And from within Exodus, you can easily change one different asset to the other. They also allow you to buy crypto with fiat. And they even have a great offer where you can buy up to $500 worth of crypto through their iOS app and pay just $1 in fee. So go to exodus.com slash epicenter and check out their wallet. We want to thank Exodus 
for their amazing support of App Center. So you mentioned token economics as as a mode for curve. Like, what is it about you know the curve token economics that you think gives that kind of mode? Well, I think uh, it's kind of uh, probably quite easy to understand. In a naive way, you can have pools earning uh, all the fees for themselves. So let's say you deposit into the pool and all the exchange fees go to you as a liquidity provider. But, you know, market is not very stable. So sometimes these fees can go up by a factor of 10, then drop down. That We've seen that. So it's, a, it's good to introduce some sort of inertia there. And we introduce that by doing uh, basically token emissions. So some of the token emissions go to the pool liquidity providers, but some of the fees go to, uh, to the DAO, which means basically the token holders, or well, token lockers, if to, to be more exact. So we have this, this loop where CRV gets fees, and those who would have, who basically paid part of those fees, they get CRV. And if the volume, trading volume goes down temporarily, well, users still get CRV, but when it goes up, then CRV gets more fees. So this kind of, this allows the protocol to operate with a higher long-term stability. But, you know, we still would need to see how it goes over, I don't know, over a bear market. We still haven't seen that. Yeah, because you basically, you have the fees that are like volatile and then you have the curve rewards and the curve rewards are based just on like the volume in the pool as opposed to the trading volume. No, actually not that. Curve rewards are split... Uh, proportionally between liquidity providers and the amount of curve rewards is determined uh, by the DAO with so-called weight voting. But anyway, this, the speed of curve rewards coming in doesn't depend on the volume uh, which happens in the pool. But really it's voting of the DAO which indirectly is inspired by how much volume the pool is making. So basically Imagine that some pool is very popular and uh, it gets a lot of uh, trading volume. And then let's say DAO participants say, oh, looks like this pool, is er this pool is earning quite good money for the DAO. We probably should vote for this pool to get more CRV. So if it gets more CRV, more users will put money into that pool and, you know, it, it will get even more volume because there is a high demand and we get more fees. So that's kind of how it works. It's not a very fast uh, feedback, but that's actually good because this makes basically returns for liquidity providers uh, a little bit more stable. Kind of going back to a little bit of an early uh, discussion that we had earlier was about kind of the future of Curve. What's the next step? Like, when do you think that you'll have, like, kind of your response to Uniswap V3 or Curve V2? Or do you have any plans currently? Uh, and can you give us a sneak peek of what might be in that as well? Well, I guess it's uh, not changing anything for stablecoin pools. They stablecoin pools are probably good as they are but we probably would need to expand into different asset classes. And um, actually the work over there is very close to, uh, to launching that. So, so that's, uh, yeah, basically expanding to volatile pairs. And we want to do it in fully automated way. So not requiring liquidity providers to do that much of the manual work. And it's, it's a challenging thing, so we will uh, see how it works. And it's challenging because you probably may find a lot of research where people tried to, to do automatic market making in like non-DeFi world. And it's, uh, it's hard. It's hard to do effectively. And we 
kind of what that research tells you is that it's almost impossible to do uh, to do it too much more effectively than what we've seen with Uniswap V2 or Balancer, right? That we want to kind of kind of defy this this common wisdom which existed before and uh, and show that it's actually possible to do it much more effectively than before. Oh, that, that's interesting. You are saying that so. I, I was under the impression that actually all the ma- market makers have only really been used in crypto and in DeFi, but ha- so have there been, I don't know, significant usage or research into AMM outside and in, in what areas? Of course, of course. Uh, I mean, they are called trading bots and trading bots are quite quite there, but you don't really want those trading bots who, I don't know, who look at um, some crocodile figure on the graph and decide that it's time to buy. But you actually, you are more think about trading bots who create markets. And uh, there was, I'm sure market making firms use those. I mean, that's just, I guess that's the way. But also there was a lot of public research about that. And if you, if you read that, you probably may get an impression that it's it's super hard to create anything useful. And yeah, we will we will see if we can do better than all of that research. If what we created is better. Another question that I had was um what is your thesis on good governance? So you know the curve token is both a way to incentivize good behavior in the protocol, but also like fundamentally a governance token Uh, and different projects have taken different kind of views of what good governance is like. I think, you know, Uniswap is, is kind of like trying to governance minimize and make sure that any governance improvements are really vital and key and and important and other protocols, maybe Yearn uh, are much more uh, kind of move fast and break things. It seems, what do you, C for curve specifically as like ideal governance and the ideal DAO structure in the long run? Well, I mean, the current DAO is specifically designed to, to be a good DAO in the long run. One of the ideas is that you probably want the voice of long-term token holders Rather than uh, rather than those who can buy token, vote for something, and then immediately immediately exit. Um, so that's why we have so-called vote lock mechanism, where you vote lock CRV, and you get you know the higher governance power the longer you lock for, and you can lock for up to up to four years, and that's what most people actually do, and we kind of think that participants in the governance, uh, they, they are actually aligned with the future of that platform uh, long term. Another thing is that our system is quite modular, so you can replace certain modules based on the governance vote, uh, but at the same time you cannot change the code, so you just if governance, even if governance wanted to, it wouldn't be able to take a user's, uh, user's uh, funds. So user funds are sacred. You, like, even governance can, cannot even plausibly get to those. But uh, governance can make decisions about, like, I don't know, including future pools and some, um, some modular functionality, which we allow not everything we uh, we even used so some things are kind of programmed in to be used in the future so it's a kind of a mix of immutability and flexibility like ultimate ultimate flexibility would be replacing every any code but we kind of think it's unsafe to do even for the governance so we are taking the approach where the code is immutable and you just you know, uh, governance votes for new things, and uh, users can think whether they want to ape into into new things or not. 
what about the curve like community and ecosystem today uh, you know what what does it look like uh how, is is there a lot of participation are people you know are there, are there places to make like governance proposals as well and like what's your vision for how you want the curve ecosystem to evolve uh you mean governance wise yeah governance wise or just sort of in you know, in, in the the way you want the community to organize and to evolve the protocol as well? Well, for evolving the protocol, it would be, of course, good to expand to other chains. It's a good question if uh, governance can expand there, but, uh, piece, but, you know, having different pools on other chains and, you know, having all the money flows going across chains that's definitely possible, and that's definitely something about uh, what governance can vote for. And yeah, so I think that's one thing. Would you would you see CRV having the kind of same function, even if Curve was deployed on 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 several chains? Uh, yes, yes, but but I think there is there still should be one place where all things concentrate. Currently, it's on Ethereum, right? But like, let's say we can have pools on. Well, we actually do have already pools on a pool on Polygon, right? And also a couple of pools on Phantom, and um, we just got admin fees from Polygon back to to Curve DAO, and it worked. And we can get CRV from from Ethereum to Polygon, and that can be can be controlled by the DAO, like how much that pool gets. The DAO can live on Ethereum, but the pool is still over there on Polygon. So that's uh, an example. And this sort of scheme can work with multiple chains, multiple layer twos, or like whatever will be used for scaling Ethereum. Shifting gears a little bit, wanted to talk to you about your thoughts on like the kind of security of Curve. You know, this is a long-term project with billions of dollars, I think like more than $7 billion of TVL. So how do you think about security and especially in like the decentralized context where code is being written by many different people? How do you think about security and ensuring that like the code is always extremely high quality, readable and and secure? Yeah, that's uh, that's a good question. We took a probably approach different from what some projects have. So from our observation, most of the errors in the code are coming from the developer, right? So it's really up to the developer to, to get the good code quality. Yes, you can say that auditors can help uh, to get code quality better. That's true to some degree, but also auditors don't see absolutely everything and they, they can miss things. Uh, so how to prevent that? I think the best way is to have all the code very, very well readable so that like it's you know the focus should be on readability and for that we use viper language because like viper is much much more readable than solidity by humans at least and that ensures that we ourselves can can see can see things in our code still sometimes we don't see them immediately but we can not notice them much faster than if everything was in solidity. So that's one of the things. And of course, solidity is a much more mature language, which with more tools. So in, in that regard, one could argue that it, as a language, it could be safer. But given that most errors, they don't actually come from the compiler, most errors come from humans, the focus should be on readability. And of course, which is true for all projects, there should be very good test coverage. So automatic testing is, is the must for smart contracts. In fact, I think smart contract code takes maybe 5% of all the lines of code, maybe less, and everything else is automated tests. 
So for those we actually do quite advanced uh, things with Brownie. For example, you could you could basically enumerate all the all the actions which smart contract or maybe external contracts can do, and then you can let um, this tool to select different actions at random with random parameters and explore this parameter space trying to find some violations or basically some errors something which you don't want in your behavior and if if that happens it kind of raises a flag and you say oh there is something in the code which we need to fix right and i think this way actually is able to come up with flash loan attacks for example like these sandwich attacks you can yeah they are actually simple so i think i think proper automated tooling can find them automatically one last question i wanted to ask was uh kind of legal and regulatory you know how, how do you think about the legal and regulatory questions around curve whether it comes to like securities laws for like curve token itself uh, you know allowing people in different jurisdictions to use uh, the protocol um, and also just like how do you think like what are the biggest risks you see to like general DeFi regulatory landscape as well right right yeah so that's that's a very good question as well there are different themes which are going in in regulatory space in the past it was mostly activity by SEC and security tokens and I think with CRV well, at least in my opinion, it's quite simple. You, so the CRV token itself is not doing any function which is looking like a security. But if you lock it, you get some something called VE CRV, which is which allows you to vote in the DAO. It receives profits from the DAO, so it's kind of well feels like a security. But VE CRV is not movable. You cannot move it, you cannot trade it, it's like only sitting in your wallet. And when it unlocks, when it becomes CRV again, then it doesn't have that functionality. So, um, so in my opinion, VE CRV is a security, but because it's not movable, it's, uh, um, it, automatically, it automatically satisfies all the security laws. And CRV itself is just, I think, a utility token. But yeah, but SEC, I think, is quite friendly to crypto projects these days. There is also a question about uh, inter like international money transmission uh, initiatives like FATF. That, that could be tricky for DeFi because they are trying to regulate what, what is not very much possible to regulate. Probably some common ground will be found at, uh, over time, but yeah, so like, for example, if they say that all projects should, should filter users or whatever, it's just not possible to do with everything deployed. So everything deployed just continues to exist and uh, nothing can change that. Um, they could as well call Vitalik and ask him to do that and he couldn't do anything, right? So. If we think from, from the basics, what are the goals of that? The goals are to protect users and to prevent criminal activity. When it comes to protecting users, I think the biggest threat in DeFi is very different from traditional financial world. In traditional financial world, the biggest risk is counterparty risk. So let's say basically if you put money in a bank, how can you make sure that this bank doesn't run away with your money? Of course, very heavy financial regulations are there to ensure that. With DeFi, if, well, it's of course a risk if it's a custodial protocol. If, if the team has admin keys uh, which allow to take the money. But if it's not the case, the biggest risk is actually the code quality. So, and I think eventually we will see a lot of regulations around the code quality and how the projects can ensure that users are safe in that on that front and with criminal activity that's actually also interesting because actually blockchains are very transparent 
and it's uh, fairly easy to see where everything goes and that probably doesn't make cryptocurrencies the best uh, the best tool of criminals they do try to use that and they many of them fail at that and i think at the moment at the moment cryptocurrencies involve less of a fraction of criminal related transactions than traditional financial system or at least i've seen that kind of information published anything else that you kind of want to add here or you want users to know about curve or before we we sort of wrap up well i think i think we quite covered uh, everything and yeah i think it would be a pretty exciting time now we have a bunch of new stuff to publish and uh, um, yeah if uh, if the listeners can follow that they probably will hear quite a lot of interesting things soon cool how do uh potential listeners and users how do people get started and learn more of course they can go to curve.fi and just start using it we have also resources.curve.fi with with all the guides how to use curve uh, with for one or other purpose i think those those would be the best places to start cool thanks so much michael thank you for joining us on this week's episode we release new episodes every week you can find and subscribe to the show on itunes spotify youtube soundcloud or wherever you listen to podcasts and if you have a google home or alexa device you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, the guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week. <laughs>